for weekly uh, colloquium. Um, uh, I would like to use the five minutes that I usually uh, use in making announcements uh, to show you uh, a video that was uh, produced by uh, Fabio Facucci. He's a, um, uh, a postdoc fellow at Yale uh, working on black holes, especially the formation of black holes in the early universe, the seeds of quasars. And uh, there is a uh, a branch of uh, TED uh, videos that is dedicated to education uh, of kids. And he produced a, a very short uh, segment of uh, less than five minutes that I would like to show, uh, in which uh, he actually, uh, in the description of this segment, he refers to the Black Hole Initiative uh, and says that um, uh, it's the first and currently only center in the world that uh, studies black holes and that. Uh, and, and that's this. This video was viewed by almost a million kids uh, over the past uh, month or so that it's out. So I think it's um, a very nice uh, outreach activity and also highlights the importance of the Black Hole Initiative. So why don't we uh, just watch it for a few minutes before we start with the scientific talks? <laughs> well, he actually. Apply. He will apply. <laughs> What's his skill? He works with From asteroids capable of destroying entire species to gamma ray bursts and supernovae that could exterminate life on Earth. Outer space has no shortage of forces that could wreak havoc on our tiny planet. But there's something in space that seems more terrifying than any of these. Something that wipes out everything it comes near. Could the Earth be swallowed by a black hole? A black hole is an object so dense that space and time around it are inescapably modified, warped into an infinite sink. Nothing, not even light, can move fast enough to escape a black hole's gravitational pull once it passes a certain boundary, known as the event horizon. Thus, a black hole is like a cosmic vacuum cleaner with infinite capacity, gobbling up everything in its path and letting nothing out. To determine whether a black hole could swallow the Earth, we first have to figure out where they are. But since they don't emit light, how's that possible? Fortunately, we're able to observe their effect on the space around them. When matter approaches a black hole, the immense gravitational field accelerates it to high speed. This emits an enormous amount of light. And for objects too far away to be sucked in, the massive gravitational force still affects their orbits. If we observe several stars orbiting around an apparently empty point, a black hole could be leading the dance. Similarly, light that passes close enough to an event horizon will be deflected in a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. Most of the black holes that we've found can be thought of as two main types. The smaller ones, called stellar mass black holes, have a mass up to 100 times larger than that of our sun. They're formed when a massive star consumes all its nuclear fuel and its core collapses. We've observed several of these objects as close as 3,000 light years away, and there could be up to 100 million small black holes just in the Milky Way galaxy. So should we be worried? Probably not. Despite their large mass, stellar black holes only have a radius of around 300 kilometers or less, making the chances of a direct hit with us minuscule. Although because their gravitational fields can affect the planet from a large distance, they could be dangerous even without a direct collision. If a typical stellar mass black hole were to pass in the region of Neptune, the orbit of the Earth would be considerably modified, with dire results. Still, the combination of how small they are and how vast the galaxy is means that stellar black holes don't give us much to worry about but we still have to meet the second type, supermassive black holes. These have masses millions or billions times greater than that of our sun 
and to have event horizons that could span billions of kilometers. These giants have grown to immense proportions by swallowing matter and merging with other black holes. Unlike their stellar cousins, supermassive black holes aren't wandering through space. Instead, they lie at the center of galaxies, including our own. Our solar system is in a stable orbit around a supermassive black hole that resides at the center of the Milky Way, at a safe distance of 25,000 light years. But that could change. If our galaxy collides with another, the Earth could be thrown towards the galactic center, close enough to the supermassive black hole to be eventually swallowed up. In fact, a collision with the Andromeda galaxy is predicted to happen 4 billion years from now, which may not be great news for our home planet. But before we judge them too harshly, black holes aren't simply agents of destruction. They played a crucial role in the formation of galaxies, the building blocks of our universe. Far from being shadowy characters in the cosmic play, black holes have fundamentally contributed in making the universe a bright and astonishing place. For a fast-paced, freewheeling tour of life, the universe, and everything, we highly recommend New York Times bestseller, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You can download an audio version of the book narrated by the inimitable Stephen Fry for free at audible.com slash TED-Ed. Oh, yeah. The lesson... This particular lesson was uh, produced by Fabio, and uh, he's visiting the BHI every now and then, um, and we are great. To, I think it's a beautiful attraction for kids to see. Uh, at least my daughter says. <laughs> she wasn't scared. No? <laughs> so we are now starting the scientific component. <laughs> Right, so for our first speaker, we're very, ha very happy to have Monica Pate. Monica is a student here at Harvard in physics, working with uh, Andy Strominger, and she will tell us about the gravitational memory in higher dimensions. Okay, uh, thanks, Laura, for the introduction. So today, I'm going to tell you about gravitational memory in higher dimensions, and this is based on a paper I wrote with Amar Karyu and Andy Strominger last year. Now, uh, before I tell you about gravitational memory in higher dimensions, I'm going to remind you what gravitational memory, the gravitational memory effect is uh, in four dimensions. So uh, this was discovered uh, by Zelkovich and Polarev in 1974, and has been uh, studied, well studied, uh, since then. So, in particular, um, Huginsky and Thorne considered uh, the scattering or collision of massive objects, such as stars or black holes, and um, in that uh, scattering, uh, so the scattering produces uh, gravitational waves. And what they found was that to a distant observer, these gravitational waves induce a permanent shift in a particular component of the asymptotic metric. So in particular, this transverse traceless uh, part of the metric. And what they found, as I've shown here, is a specific formula for this shift in the metric in terms of the core momentum of the colliding objects and this vector, uh, this four vector K, which is a null four vector, which for them was a past directed uh, null four vector from the observer to the source, but as we'll see, this can also be uh, related to the uh, four momentum of the graviton, which which uh, makes up this gravitational radiation. So is it uh, appropriate to interpret that simply with uh, as the state of energy, the gravitational radiation energy from the region such that the zero, zero component of the metric is modified? So you have less mass within that. Region. It's more than just that, right? It's also, it's, it's more than just the energy, it's the energy um, distribution over the sphere, which doesn't have to be spherical. And that's important, right? So, so there's some non-trivial profile of energy over the sphere that's being emitted. Okay. And uh, so as I said, it's, it's this transverse, it's a shift in the transverse uh, component of the metric, but practically the way these um, observers 
would, the way an observer would actually detect this is that the nearby inertial observers would detect a permanent shift in their relative displacement. So the idea, I saw I've shown it here on a conformal diagram, and these blue lines represent uh, the massive colliding objects. They produce some gravitational radiation, and the observers, which are far away, which is why they're near these um, null boundaries called null infinity, so the idea is that their world lines oscillate as the gravitational radiation passes through, and then after the gravitational radiation has passed, they are now displaced by a different amount than they were originally. Okay, so I told you what gravitational memory is, but why is it interesting? Well, first of all, it's a potentially measurable prediction of general relativity, and in fact, there are proposals to measure the gravitational memory effect at LIGO. But second of all, this, this uh, memory effect is the observable signature of an infinite dimensional set of symmetries <coughs> called uh, EMS symmetries after uh, most of their discoverers. And these symmetries are important for black, black hole physics because they imply that black holes, so instead of the standard law that black holes are relatively featureless objects, characterized by dimensional numbers, such as you know, angular momentum, mass, charge. Instead, they actually carry an additional infinite number of labels associated to the charges of these symmetries. OK, but then you may ask, why should we care about gravitational memory at higher dimensions? And the answer to that is that symmetries like EMS are not unique to gravitational theories in four dimensions. Rather, there are analogs of these infinite dimensional symmetries in generic theories of gauge and gravity. And so, on the one hand, it's rather remarkable that vastly different theories have this sort of universal uh, behavior in the infrared, um, but also it's, it's practically useful to recognize this fact. In particular, because certain features of the, U, of the infrared physics have been discovered in a particular theory, and by making this universal uh, uh, behavior precise, we can understand what the analogs of those infrared effects are in generic gauge theories. So, um, so this this line of discoveries we can uh, so this line of discoveries we can um, summarize in uh, this so-called infrared triangle. And what it represents is a set of precise equivalents among these topics at the corners. And the edges represent how we make those that equivalence precise. So in particular, I've already described for you the gravitational memory effect. And as I said, it's this relative displacement of inertial observers due to the transit of gravitational waves. And um, but really what they're doing is they're measuring a permanent shift in the asymptotic data. So more generally, in a generic gauge theory, this memory effect should be understood as a permanent shift in asymptotic data. Now, uh, the soft theorems are known from the quantum field theory literature, and what they are is they characterize the universal behavior, and in particular the singularity structure of scattering amplitudes, as you take one of the massless scattering uh, particles to be soft, by which I mean very, very low momentum. And so physically what this is telling us is it's telling us that uh, the soft radiation that's produced in a scattering event is actually highly constrained in terms of the hard particles or energetic particles that are participating in the scattering event. And finally, asymptotic symmetries are symmetries of any system with an asymptotic boundary, but in particular, we're going to be interested in infinite dimensional ones. So, uh, for example, as I've mentioned, these EMS symmetries were originally discovered when people were looking at asymptotically flat spacetimes, which is how people precisely describe isolating gravitational systems. And what you might expect is you might expect that such systems should have Poincaré as their symmetry group. However, what they found was instead an infinite dimensional enhancement of the Poincaré group. And so these are the types of symmetries that we're going to be interested in. So, uh, as I said, uh, these, these um, edges represent how we make uh, this equivalence between these subjects precise. So in particular, 
one can study the canonical charges associated to this symmetry, and one finds that their Morgan identity is in fact precisely the Salk theorem. Now, as I said, the Salk, the Salk theorem characterizes the singularity structure of scattering amplitudes. So in particular, if one takes a Fourier transform of a pool in frequency space, this turns into a step function in time. And the step function in time is actually exactly telling us about this shift in the asymptotic data that happens in the memory effect. And finally, so uh, this shift can be viewed as a domain wall that interpolates between inequivalent vacua. And if one studies how these vacua are related, one finds that they're actually related by the action of the symmetry. And so to reiterate, the idea is that by establishing such a precise equivalence, if we know of one effect, can in one in a particular theory, we should be able to find the other two. And in practice, uh, this is rather subtle, and that is uh, will be the subject of my talk. All of this was arrived in the context of gravity, or like the soft theorem was done for scattering experiments. So this precise equivalence was originally discovered in four-dimensional gravity, oh. but. Yeah, soft theorems have been known really you know, since the 20s, and for QED was originally where they were discovered. Right, so, so this precise equivalence was actually only recently discovered a few years ago <coughs> and in the context of four-dimensional gravity. And so in particular, what they found was that Weinberg's soft graviton theorem was precisely equivalent to this gravitational memory effect by this Fourier transform. And moreover, that both of these were the consequence of the supertranslation symmetry. But as I've said, the point is that if we know of one corner, then we should know about the other two, and that this sort of phenomena is supposed to be a universal feature of, of generic theories of gauge and gravity. So if we consider gravity in higher dimensions, the Weinberg soft graviton theorem turns out generalizes in a very straightforward way, but there are results, there are many results in the literature that, suggest, that say that there is no gravitational memory effect, nor is there an infinite dimensional enhancement of Poincaré. So immediately we arise at a puzzle. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you what the resolution of this puzzle is, and sort of the crux of the confusion was the fact that, so if one considers linearized perturbations about, for example, a flat Minkowski background in generic dimensions, one finds that these perturbations fall off like r to the d divided by two minus one. And so one associates with that to be the radiate, the fall of a radiative data. On the other hand, we can compare it with the fall off of, for example, higher dimensional versions of Schwarzschild. And that falls off like r to the d minus three. And so that we associate as sort of fall off of coulombic data. And in four dimensions, if you plug in d equals four, you find that these two are the same. So, but then by working in higher dimensions, we actually write, we break this degeneracy and we figure out where certain effects actually lie. And so the resolution of the puzzle is that this gravitational memory effect really is about a shift in asymptotic data that falls off uh, that has Coulombic fall off at large radius. And uh, I should mention, so here, as I've said, these, these, these uh, inequivalent vacua are related by the action of the symmetry, and so what that tells us is that the vacuum is actually spontaneous, this vacuum spontaneously breaks the symmetry. And we can interpret the, the degree of freedom that's parametrizing this um, that parameterizes the vacuum and that shifts under the memory effect as being the Goldstone boson associated to this spontaneous breaking. Excuse me. Yes. If you, if even <coughs> in four dimension you have massive gravity, then it's not toilet anymore, or because then the Coulombic relation doesn't hold anymore. Yeah. So we're assuming a massless graviton. And another question is, what is the interpretation of that infinite constant charge that you just said? I mean, because the mass and charge and whatever, they are just intuitively understandable. But if you have infinite charge that you want somehow to measure, for example, in LIGO or whatsoever, 
then we'll help, but we can't be separate. Then. So first of all, um, I'm going to get there, but the, those those charges are in principle measurable by this gravitational memory effect. And how do you want to? Um, the physical interpretation is that it's telling you some. It, we know something about the profile of energy, something about the rate the the. Uh, yeah, sorry, the distribution of energy over the sphere. And so to be honest, like that sort of work is still ongoing. People have, you know, people, there are various proposals about how it's going to be encoded, you know, on the horizon and all that sort of stuff, and that's not known. Right. Uh, so, so this Goldstone boson that I've mentioned, which is parameterizing, um, the different in equivalent vacua appears at this coulombic order, and so in particular, it's additional data that must be that must be specified subleading to the radiative data. And so uh, the result is that there is actually a triangle of precise equivalence between Weinberg's soft graviton theorem, this gravitational memory effect that occurs at coulombic order, and an infinite dimensional symmetry which also acts at this coulombic. So now I'm going to get into the sort of nuts and bolts of how we established this. And what we did is we worked descriptively around the Minkowski background in the modern gauge, and we worked, we fixed uh, this coordinate system for our background, uh, for our Minkowski background, and this coordinate system is nice because uh, this retarded time mu can be interpreted as the observer time at null infinity. These, uh, we use uh, these coordinates z to parameterize uh, the transverse sphere, and uh, as you take this r to infinity, it fixed you one reaches null infinity. So the first thing we did was a sort of standard asymptotic symmetry analysis, and the idea is that the asymptotic symmetry group are the allowed gauge symmetries quotiented by the trivial gauge symmetry. And so to determine allowed gauge symmetries, what one does is one fixes some boundary conditions and then determines the residual diffeomorphism which preserves those boundary conditions, and also harmonic gauge, because that's the gauge we're working in. And so uh, this was a somewhat complicated procedure, but we ended up, uh, by, by fixing a little bit more of this harmonic gauge, we were able to distinguish between radiative degrees and coulombic degrees of freedom, and we we took these perturbations to fall off with, um, this was the radiator fall off that I quoted, quoted for you earlier, where now I'm defining D as 2M plus 2, and this is the Coulombic uh, fall off that I also quoted for you earlier. And I should mention that we studied this in only even higher dimensions because there are technical subtleties um, associated to odd higher dimensions. And so uh, by looking for the diffeomorphisms, so we looked for then diffeomorphisms which preserved uh, these boundary conditions in a harmonic gauge, and what we found was to leading order a diffeomorphism which falls off, like uh, which has columbic fall off, and is entirely parameterized by a single function on the sphere. So it's just f here, f here and here. But of course, we want to make sure. Uh, to determine a actual asymptotic symmetries, we want to ensure that these types of diffeomorphisms are non-trivial. And so the way to do this is we study a memory effect, we try to find a non-trivial memory effect associated to this symmetry, and if we can find a non-trivial memory effect, which is something physical, then these symmetries are non-trivial. And by trivial, that should be synonymous with redundant. Okay, so, what we want by analogy with the four dimensional case, what we do is we consider the transit of gravitational radiation on a pair of nearby inertial observers at large radius. And for simplicity, we take them to have zero radial displacement and some small but finite displacement on the transverse sphere. <coughs> and uh, to leading order and large R by working in this coordinate system, we find that these ge the geodes the tangent vectors of the geodesics <coughs> are in the U direction and um, and then we study the relative displacement of these uh, inertial observers. And so their relative displacement for basic geodesic deviation equation, which you see in here, 
Um, and by working in uh, with our boundary conditions, we find that this part component of the curvature tensor is simply the second order, uh, second new derivative of this particular component of the metric. So um, what we want to do is we want to consider a system which is a radiated vacuum at some initial <coughs> time, and so we can just integrate this equation twice. And we find the change in their uh, relative displacement is given in terms of the change of this component of the metric. Now, since we are studying initial and final configurations which are radiated vacua, we can actually determine the most general form of this change in this component of the metric. And in particular, it's determined by the residual diffeomorphisms, simply because these radiative data must be diffeomorphic to just, well, they're diffeomorphic to each other and they're diffeomorphic just to a pure Minkowski background. And so, um, so since they are, uh, they, since they're diffeomorphic to a pure Minkowski background by this residual diffeomorphism, we find that the most general form of this change in the metric is parameterized by this single function C and falls off like a coulombic order. And so this C is just a function on the transverse sphere that would appear in, compon in components of the vacuum metric. And more precisely, it's characterizing the vacuum configuration at a given retarded time. Uh, and if we recall our, that residual diffeomorphism that we found, we find that this C shifts under the diffeomorphism just by, um, as a, transforms on the diffeomorphism by a shift. And so, in other words, the C is the Goldstone boson that is associated to the spontaneous breaking of this symmetry. So, combining all those, these results, we find that there is a not that this, the, their, the separation between our two inertial observers undergoes some non trivial displacement due to the passage of gravitational radiation, and it's parameterized by this function C, which um, uh, which, is, which shifts under the residual symmetry that we found. So in other words, this residual diffeomorphism um, relates the earlier and late vacua. And it's not trivial because it can be measured by this type of gravi gravitational memory experiment so long as they're sensitive to effects that fall off at Coulomb with Coulomb. So long as they're sensitive to effects that fall off with Coulombic um, behavior. And so what we've done is we've established um, a relationship between, well, well, we've both established this asymptotic symmetry and this non-trivial memory effect, and as well as the relationship between the two of them. Now, uh, to close this triangle, we would like to establish the connection of these effects to the soft graviton theorem. And so in particular, the way this works is that we, the soft graviton theorem should provide a formula for, for, for a shift in precisely the same component of the metric, and it should, it should provide a formula for the amount that this component of the metric shifts as a function of the gravitational radiation. So the strategy for doing this is to begin with Weinberg's soft graviton theorem and turn it into a ward identity for charge conservation. And in doing so, we'll ex obtain an explicit expression for the conserved charges associated to this symmetry in terms of these asymptotic fields. Then, if we impose a matching condition on certain asymptotic data, we are, so we impose an antipodal matching condition or spatial infinity on this, on this asymptotic data, we will find this implies a charge conservation. And the charge conservation law will yield for us a formula for a shift in the degrees of freedom that we've identified are responsible for the memory effect. So to begin, um, we're going to look at Weinberg's soft graviton theorem. And I, uh, I put it here. And what it does is it's relating a scattering amplitude where we consider the insertion, where we consider the scattering amplitude for it the emission of an additional soft graviton. And what we find is that it is related by a number to the scattering amplitude without 
that additional soft ground harm. And this number only is sort of only depends on the four momentum of the particles that are participating in the scattering process, the momentum of the soft graviton, and its polarization. And so to turn this into a word identity for charge conservation, the goal is that we want to express both of these in terms of the asymptotic fields. So in particular, we're going to find that this left-hand side, which contains our soft graviton, is going to be related to the shift in this Goldstone boson. And the right-hand side is going to be related to the flux of gravitational radiation through null infinity. So in particular, the union component of the energy momentum. So in detail, the way we do this um, is, so right now we're going to work on uh, the right-hand side to show that it's related to this uh, union component of the energy momentum tensor. And what we do is we parameterize uh, null four momentum in terms of their energy and the point on, this, on the sphere where these particles exit. And in doing that, we can turn this soft factor here into just some function on the sphere that depends on the point where the soft graviton exits and the point where all the other particles exit. And next what we do is we seek a differential operator for which this is the Green's function. So in other words, we seek some differential, op differential operator which, when acting upon this function, we just classes it to a sum of delta functions. And so this differential operator was worked out previously in uh, some complicated form. But the point is that uh, this sort of term here we can recognize as the local energy density um, on the sphere at, asymptotic, at, at null infinity. And so we can straightforwardly relate it to the UU component of the energy momentum tensor. Now, as I said, on the other side, we want to relate the soft graviton theorem, uh, so, sorry, we want to relate the soft graviton to the shift in this Coulombic data. And so this is sort of done in, in uh, two steps which are then combined. So the first thing is to relate graviton and creation and annihilation operators to the radiative data. And so this is done by considering um, a Fourier mode expansion of the gravitational perturbation. And by performing this at a point approximation at large r, one finds that the Fourier modes which create annihilate soft, uh, which create and annihilate gravitons are naturally related to the radiative data. Now we can relate the radiative data to the Columbic data by using uh, Einstein's equations plus this somewhat complicated gauge fixing procedure that we uh, found. And what one finds is that this radiative data is related uh, to the Columbic data by some complicated uh, differential operators on the sphere and some number of U derivatives, which are essentially encoding the fact that this Coulombic data falls off much more quickly at large r than the radiative data. And so putting the two together, we can relate graviton creation and annihilation operators to Coulombic data. And in particular, by looking at this soft graviton, so the zero frequency one, we find that this is related, again, by some differential operator on the sphere to this shift in the Columbic order data. And more precisely, if we consider um, if we consider a, a transit from, uh, from one radiative one radiative vacuum to the other, then this can be written in terms of this Goldstone boson delta C. So to summarize, what we did is we showed that this soft uh, graviton is in fact related to uh, the shift in, rate in, in Coulombic order data, which was the thing that is responsible, the shift that is responsible for the memory effect. And we found that this soft factor here is related to the flux of gravitational radiation. Now, um, one can put this in a form such one can rewrite, by using uh, these pieces of information, one can rewrite uh, this soft theorem as a word identity like this um, where these charges 
again contained a contribution from uh, the, the flux of, radi of gravitational radiation through null infinity, and then also this shift in coulombic order data. And after a little bit more work, one can show that this sort of charge, which is written as an integral over null infinity, can actually be written in terms of uh, an integral over the boundary of null infinity. So this we use to denote the past of null infinity. And it's all written in terms of just a simple, uh, a particular component of the Lyell tensor. And so then, um, if one antipodally matches this component of the Lyell tensor, so first of all, one can define uh, similar charges at past null infinity, and that's P minus. And then if one antipodally matches this component of the Lyell tensor with the one that appears in P minus, one obtains the conservation law of these charges. And so uh, in particular, then this conservation law, by sort of working backwards and expanding this over null infinity, uh, both past and future null infinity, one can relate the change in this component of the gauge field to, or one find the formula for the change in this component of the gauge field in terms of the flux of gravitational radiation. Okay, uh, so to conclude, we found that uh, memory effects in infinite dimensional asymptotic symmetries persist in higher dimensional uh, theories of gravity, and in particular, this gravitational memory effect in infinite dimensional symmetry appear at Coulombic order and are related to uh, Feinberg's soft graviton theorem in the same way as in four dimensions. And um, so in particular, this, this soft graviton theorem is a consequence of the symmetry and provides a precise formula for the shift in asymptotic data that gives rise to the gravitational memory effect. And so thus we conclude that this IR triangle is actually a universal feature of gauge theories, theories of gauge and gravity in higher dimensions. And uh, this contains important lessons for how we should think about infrared divergences, because for example, um, it has been recently understood that these infrared divergences are actually uh, related to this symmetry, but the lack of infrared divergences in higher dimensions is not because the symmetry is not there. It just appears in a more subtle way. And uh, second of all, uh, this, this form contains important lessons for super rotations in four dimensions because we've learned that the asymptotic data needed to understand these effects may appear in subradiative order. And that seems to be uh, probably what will happen for super rotations as well. So, you know, the gravitational memory effect. There is an analogous electromagnetic memory effect, which at least when I look at it, looks fairly trivial. Nothing very deep about it. But after listening to your talk, I was just kind of wondering, is there an equivalent triangle there? Is there a, an infrared triangle for the electromagnetic problem? And what are the other two vertices right. so in there, that problem? Yeah. So there is a, an electromagnetic version of this. And so first of all, uh, if one considers what the effect on probes is going to be in the electromagnetic case, it turns out that instead of getting some displacement, you just shift the charge. Uh, well, you might ask, I have two charged particles, yeah. and they go from, they experience one radiative vacuum, and then sometime later experience some other radiative vacuum. What do I see? And it turns out that they get some relative kick, velocity kick, right? It can be either a velocity or even just a displacement depending on the signal, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there, there is a soft graviton, there's a, there's a yeah. soft what photon there. Yeah. Soft theorem, but it's not a graviton. It's a soft photon. Soft, soft, soft photon. Uh -huh. And um, there, there's an infinite dimensional symmetry, which one might, it looks like it, it, it's part of the gauge symmetry, but it should be interpreted as physical, because it gives rise to these non-trivial effects. So it's, it looks like the usual, shift under gauge symmetry. I guess that's the part I'm not getting. It's something, you know, AU goes to AU. 
Right, so replace diffeomorphism with gauge symmetry. Okay. Then so that means there is no geometry. measure. So for the gra for the gravity dissolved with geometric, right? You can just connect the displacement between observer to edge. But for the for the photon, it's just the internal symmetry that is. You, you see what I mean? How do you want to connect that to something observer the geometry? Right. So here you've got something I want to look at. Right. So what we what we saw before, right? In geodesic deviation, we had something like du squared <coughs> sa, right? Was like du squared. And I integrate twice and find some, some, some relative displacement. The analog here should be something like uh, dx squared dt, so this is like mv, right? And this should be something like the electric field. So this should be, this is ma, f equals ma, right? f equals ma force is electric charge times e, and this e is something like a. So the point is I integrate once and I find delta B is something like <coughs> delta A. And this delta A is going to be one of these forms, going to be something in this form, and so this is the, the only same. place where A appears is in the phases in front of the panel, right? It doesn't appear classically. That's right. So you so can measure it with the Aron of Bonnachon. Sure. <laughs> this is a completely classical thing. But this is also completely classical. Yeah, yeah. We'll measure it. But the, the, the effect is completely classical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so you are saying A is not observable. Or, yeah. It changes yeah. in AR. But, but it's a derivative of A. So I think that it's all right. <laughs> um, what, what do you say that this not just in black holes, but it, you would see it in any high gravity, I mean, would you see it in neutron stars, for instance, like that, gravitational? Yeah, this is insensitive to what is what is, what is pr producing gravitational waves. So, so is there a way, is there something in the expressions that you have there that give a scale or, or have an indication of what the strength of the effect rises with? So first of all, so in higher dimensions, it's going to fall off with Columbic order and all that. So right. if you're too far away, you're not going to be able to see it. Right. Um, but more generally, uh, but but the, the rest of it is going to be given by uh, the four momentum of the things that are participating in the collision, uh, and and this basically is encoding some sort of angular profile. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on the odd dimensional case? What are the problems, and what do you expect to see there? Right. So the problem is that one nice way to study these things is to uh, do a conformal transformation and embed it in something like the Einstein static universe. And uh, if you do that and want some sort of, uh, and want your data to be smooth, you will find that that is not true in odd dimensions. And the, the easy way to see that is that, so this sort of fall off behavior is, is supposed to be for any dimension, and if one plugs in something odd, one finds that these fall off like like half a million hours. And so people people are, you know, there are constructions that are that deal with this, but it's just it's more complicated. Is there something about analyticity of the uh, how the wave function behaves with infinity? Or? Right, it has some, some sort of tail that doesn't I guess we can move on the segment together. So 
Our next speaker is Zhongli Zhanyu. Uh, he's a postdoc here in Harvard in physics as well. And he will tell us about aspect, aspects of black hole binaries in triple systems. Um, thank you, Laura, for our introduction. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here talking about our recent work. Actually, I've been sitting here since the very first PHI equilibrium, and this is my first half of that time. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, I'd like to talk about something I have been doing with uh, Lisa Rendo also at Harvard Physics uh, about the binary black holes and gravitational waves. And I just found this uh, marvelous painting very apt for our purpose because uh, the first question we were asking after, right after the LIGO discovery was that what we can learn from the binary black hole, not only about itself, but also about its environment. So probably we can try to probe dark matter. That was the first idea in our mind. Uh, and in this marvelous painting, you do see a binary black hole here, and you have some environmental stuff like supermassive black hole here or something I cannot recognize. Uh, but the basic idea is, how can we learn anything about the environment of binary black holes? Um, so the first slide of my talk is already a cliche, but let me run quickly through it. Uh, we have discovered gravitational wave from binary black holes, and it's from the inspiraling binaries that with the separation get much uh, uh, um, more and more closer and eventually collide. Uh, and this, uh, during this process, there are gravitational waves emitting out of the system and eventually are recorded by LIGO, and we see some nice waveforms in our detector. Uh, but there remains a great mystery about where do this binary black hole from. Um, there is a very classical interpretation of this. Uh, it says that prior to the formation of binary black hole, there are actually binary stars, which are actually quite common in our universe. And once a uh, star explodes into a red giant, then a cloud created by this red giant can form a uh, common envelope, as it's called. And this uh, cloud can produce some drag force to the two core black holes and eventually drive to black holes to a very small distance. Uh, and this is called isolated channel of binary black hole formation because this kind of formation does not rely on the existence of any environmental stuff. Only the red giant cell, the cloud, does a job. But this is actually quite challenging because we know that the binary black holes do merge. So if they want to merge within a humble time, a good thing to keep in mind is that they had better begin with a very small distance so that gravitational wave can be very effective. Uh, if the binaries are from a circular orbit, then we know that to merge within a humble time, you need the initial separation to be as small as 0.1 AU. It's just one tenth of the distance from the Earth and to the Sun. So if I, if you, you know that for typical red giant, the, 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 the size of this cloud can be as large as tens of, tens of AU. So if I were to plot this to, to scale, it should look like this. This just to show you that it is actually quite challenging, although not impossible, to produce very closed binary black holes using this kind of mechanism. And alternatively, uh, there's a different way to make two black holes very close to each other. This is so-called dynamical channel. And it is exactly at this place we need some help from the environmental effect. Uh, for instance, there is a well-known paper by Avi and collaborators saying that in very dense cloud of stars and black holes, it is actually possible for two black holes to meet each other directly. And uh, at a very small distance they meet each other, they have effective gravitational wave radiation, which uh, drift, uh, drive ener drift energy quickly away from the system, and eventually they can merge. And apart from this two-body direct 
or encounter, you can also imagine that some third body can help. Uh, I was trained as a particle physicist, physicist, so I'd like to plot everything in terms of Feynman diagrams. So in this Feynman diagrams, I plot a third body here. You can imagine it uh, either uh, uh, as a uh, stellar mass black hole or the supermassive black hole at the center of the axis. So in this case, through complicated n-body interaction or three-body interactions, um, the third body can take energy away very effectively from the binary. So eventually the two black holes can be very close to each other. And this is a so-called dynamical formation. Uh, keep in mind that in this channel you can have either direct two-body encounter or you can have some third stellar mass black hole in global clusters or a supermassive black hole in the galactic center. So everything does the job. And the question is whether you can tell uh, which channel contribute to the signal we eventually observe in LIGO. So again, I want to make an analogy with a typical particle experiment at LHC. So here it is a plot showing the four lepton final state uh, on Atlas experiment. And uh, from such diagram, we can ask uh, where do this four lepton final state from? So what is their formation channel? This is completely uh, in analogous to what I was asking about binary black holes. Uh, basically, there are very uh, important three ingredients. So the first one is statistics. We need a number of events here uh, represented by blue dots, uh, sorry, black dots. And second, we need to find some nice parameters uh, in terms of which we plot the data. So here, we have plotted the data in, in terms of the uh, invariant, invariant mass of the volatile final state. So that you can try to predict the distribution of the data over the chosen parameter and uh, compare it with an experiment. So here you have different channels. The four lepton final state can be either from the Z pole or from a Higgs pole. And now let me try to do similar things for black hole formation channels. So first, we have statistics. Uh, this is the plot I particularly like, which shows that with the future uh, detector being built, like Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer, it is actually possible to probe <coughs> stellar mass black hole binaries up to redshift of order 10 or even order 100. Remember that the first star formation happened around uh, the, the, the redshift around 20. This tells us that basically we can imagine to observe all the binary black holes in our universe. So there will be many. We don't have to worry about this. The second thing is uh, what kind of parameters we want to choose to plot the distribution of these binary black holes. Uh, there are two particularly nice parameters we can use. Uh, the first one is the spin alignment. Uh, because in typical isolated formation channel that are formed through the common envelope of the red giant cloud, in that case, the spin of the two black holes tend to align with each other. While in dynamical formation, if the two black holes meet each other randomly, then you can imagine some large uh, spin misalignment. And you can see this misalignment directly from the gravitational wave signal because the angular momentum change between the orbital, angular momentum, and the spins. Uh, the second observable or the parameter we like very much is the eccentricity of the binary black holes. Uh, in this case, it is because for uh, isolated binaries uh, formed through common envelope, it is believed that eventually uh, the eccentricity will be very small, as I will show you in the next slide. While in the uh, dynamic channel, there is a large chance that the formed binary black holes can have very large eccentricity. And the large eccentricity can also show up directly 
in the gravitational wave wave form because uh, we all know from Kepler theorem that the motion of the binary is not uh, uniform in velocity. So some variation in velocity in your orbital motion will create some higher harmonics that will eventually you can measure through gravitational wave. So uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on the eccentricity stuff. So let me uh, explain in more detail what happens about its distribution. For isolated channel, I just told you that uh, we, Im we expect eventually this binary will have very small eccentricity. Uh, may I ask you to remember this function? <laughs> Not exactly these numbers, but <laughs> roughly this shape, because they will appear in the following slides. So this function shows you the orbital separation of the binary black hole as a function of eccentricity. So how to read this plot? Imagine you begin with a uh, generic eccentricity. And as the orbital separation reduces, mm -hmm. you always expect some dramatic drop of eccentricity in the orbit. So unless you begin with such large eccentricity, after many orders of magnitude reduction, you still have some finite one. Uh, in generic case, you always uh, expect that the final eccentricity in LIGO will be extremely small. This is because of, is it because of the gravitational radiation reaction? Though? Exactly. So gravitational wave carries away energy and also angular momentum. From Newtonian dynamics, you know that eccentricity is a measure of angular momentum. So it is exactly through this process, the loop eccentricity. And in dynamical channel, uh, the situation is more complicated. In this case, even in the simplest uh, uh, triple system, uh, you have a, a, a number of parameters, like the two masses of the two black holes which you can hope to measure, and uh, the mass of the th third object, probably a super black, supermassive black hole. And also, you can imagine you begin with some certain initial orbital separation initial eccentricity, the inclination between the two orbits, the distance to the third body, the eccentricity of the large orbit, uh, and so on. Then, question is, how would you predict the final eccentricity you observe in LIGO? The simplest thing, or uh, the, the direct thing one can try to do, not, a sim not simple at all, is that you can do numerical simulations. You play with uh, n-body simulations, or run your differential equations numerically uh, with input of all these initial parameters, and eventually you can predict some final eccentricity. This is, of course, very important part of your work. Uh, but what we want to do here is to ask the question of whether there's an analytical way to do this. So the question is, given all these parameter, initial parameters, can we find a simple analytical formula that directly map them to the final answer you observe in LIGO? Of course, this is only uh, supposed to be approximate uh, answer, which cannot be used to replace uh, all of numerical simulation. But this can be important, not only because you can do this uh, fast, but also, you can use such kind of analytical formula to try to find correlations with other parameters you have, other observables you can get. So let me try to uh, explain very briefly how this analytical mapping works. Uh, so let me begin with the simplest three-body uh, interaction. We have three uh, point masses and zero and one represents the two black holes in question. And probably we have a third black hole, either stellar mass or supermassive, which are quite far away. Uh, it, it is needed, uh, this, this third body, to be very far so that the binary will not be tidally disrupted. And in such a situation, we, are, we speak of a hierarchical triple, because the distance R2 to the third body is much greater than the orbital separation of the binary. 
And if you believe me, this uh, very strange Newtonian is nothing but the Newtonian dynamics of three body interacting through gravity. And I deliberately uh, package the Hamiltonian into a, uh, uh, a free motion plus two orbital motion. Because you can just think of your three body like a small orbit plus a large orbit. Just imagine this like an Earth, Moon, and Sun. Sun, I don't know what is happening. And once you do this, you realize that in, uh, on top of the Keplerian motion, you have additional piece, which actually describes the interaction between the two orbits. And of course, in generic situation, the three-body uh, problem cannot be solved completely. But in the hierarchical triple, in this case, we can expand the Hamiltonian in terms of a small parameter, which is just the ratio between the orbital separation of the two black holes with the distance to the third body. So once we do that, you will realize that this expansion is nothing but a uh, multiple expansion. And leading order is quadruple. Uh, I, uh, I should say this quadruple is very different from, it has nothing to do with the quadruple radiation of gravitational wave. It just happened to be uh, in the same order in multiple expansion. So leading order is reduced mass? Sorry, yeah, so the m here, small m here, is uh, total mass of the binary. And then capital M is? Capital M is the total mass of the three body. Sorry, I should explain. And P's and pi's are here, are conjugate, conjugate momentum. OK, but this truncated Hamiltonian at leading order is not quite good for our purpose, because it is written in terms of the uh, the distance between three bodies. And uh, we know in long term that these distances are subject to fast rotations. But what we really want to know is the circular evolution of the geometric shape of orbits, not really these fast motions. So what we want to do here is a uh, neural trick in high, energy, in high energy physics, we integrate out high energy mode, we integrate out fast mode. So here, the fast mode is just uh, the orbital motion of the small binary black hole and also the uh, rotation uh, uh, around the third object. Once you do this uh, integrating out, what is left is a simple Hamiltonian here, which are described precisely in terms of some geometric quantities. For instance, the inclination angle between the two orbits. I, uh, the, the eccentricity of the small orbit, and also the some Euler angle appears here. So the magic of this uh, expansion is that there are some accidental symmetries. So in addition to the total energy, the total angular momentum, which are of course conserved, there are also additional conserved quantities, like the energy of the small orbit the energy of the large orbit, and the magnitude of the angular momentum of the large orbit. So as a result of this, you will realize that the semi-major axis of both orbits, and also the eccentricity of the large orbit, will be conserved. So what does this mean? It means that this prefactor k will be a constant. And we also know that the total Hamiltonian H will be conserved. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we begin with a, uh, some inclination angle, uh, eventually this value can be changed. If the change of this value can be reflected into the change of this eccentricity. <coughs> so this is a so-called <coughs> causality leadoff mechanism. Uh, let me illustrate this again with uh, a plot here. I told you earlier that the total angular momentum here represented by the gray arrow is conserved, and the magnitude of the large orbit, uh, the, 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 the angular momentum of the large orbit is also conserved, so it's on a circle. And by using the angular momentum conservation, 
you form a triangle, and you see that if you begin with a large, a large inclination angle, uh, eventually this inclination angle will become a large eccentricity in the small orbit. So here is a Newtonian solution to such a system that you can actually see the change of eccentricity of your orbit. And of course, we are now dealing with gravitational waves, so Newtonian dynamics is not enough. We also need to include uh, post-Newtonian corrections, which is valid at least in, in spiral stage, because the velocity of the binary black holes are small. So in this case, if you do Newtonian dynamics, you see some small wiggles here, represented by degree curves, which shows you the oscillation of eccentricity here I'm plotting 1 minus eccentricity square. So the smaller the curve, is, the smaller the value is, the larger the eccentricity is. So you can, you can indeed reach a very large eccentricity. And the blue curve here shows you what will happen if I include post-Newtonian corrections plus gravitational, radi gravitational wave radiation. So this is actually very intuitive. Once you turn on gravitational wave, the separation between the orbit will get reduced, and eventually the binary becomes so hard that it is very difficult to perturb the binary black hole through the third body interaction. In this case, at the final stage, the binary black hole will look exactly as uh, alike isolated uh, black holes. To which order in post-Newtonian theory are you working? Good question. Uh, we include the first post-Newtonian, post which is, of course, and also point 2.5, which is the first order in gravitational wave. Thank you. Oh, I made all make sense. Oh, we have also worked on this. Yeah. People have shown that you have to go up to the octopole order. Yeah. Uh, uh, Do you include that? In no. Analysis? Not in this uh, analytical stuff. Okay. Uh, the, the this so eccentric very, orbits and very good, good question. The, the, the reason is that accidents, accidental that gave, gave you the yeah. celebrated symmetries appears yeah. only at leading order. If you go to octagon, the solution will be chaotic. Yeah. There might be an analytical track of that. We have, a we have a several papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I read it. I read yeah. it. We know. Yeah, yeah, we know. Uh, we, we talk about this about. Uh, we we know about this. Um, so this is just a solution I just showed you. And here it is a corresponding curve for orbital separation. You begin with point one AO initially, and eventually it will merge, of course. But the interesting thing is that if you zoom in the plot, so this is plotted for the entire merger time, uh, 7,000 years. If you zoom in this to a scale of several hundred years, you will realize that the reduction of orbital separation is not smooth. It's more stairwise. Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, once you are in the very large, large eccentricity stage, the periapsis distance is very small. The gravitational wave radiation is very strong. Uh, a good way to say this is that the radiation power of the gravitational wave is proportional to a very large power of the eccentricity. So once this 1 minus e squared plotted here reach a very small value, we can expect some strong gravitational wave radiation, which can strongly reduce the uh, separation of the orbit. So this actually motivates us to, to, to find an analytical formula to predict the final eccentricity. Uh, the way to do this is very simple. First, you try to find the merger time given all initial parameters. So what is the time it takes to merge? So you, you basically know what is the time scale of this cosine oscillation. And you can calculate from this power how much orbital reduction will happen in each step. And you just, just sum, up, sum up all this. You will know what is the merger time. This is the first step. The merger time is, of course, enhanced if you have large inclination angle. Here I'm plotting a merger time in terms of the distance to the third body. 
of course, if you are very close, it merges quickly. If you are very far away, it is more like isolated binaries. And the second step is that you imagine there is a fictitious binary black hole, which are in isolation. And uh, it begins with the same uh, semi-major axis, same orbital separation, but merge with the same time, with the same merger time. And you can convince yourself that such a binary black hole will, of course, subject to the G function I introduced at the very beginning. And we just use this fictitious binary to mimic the behavior of the original binaries in causality leader of oscillation in the second half of the evolution. So that eventually, here I'm plotting the same solution in terms of uh, uh, the, the semi-major axis and eccentricity. So at first you have a number of cosine leader of oscillations without effective semi-major axis reduction. But eventually gravitational wave becomes so strong that it will merge just like a uh, isolated binary. So what we do is just to try to find a, a, another fictitious binary black hole here represented by dashed lines, which will predict the same eccentricity in the final stage of the merger. Uh, and this is a very simple formula you will get, uh, which just gave you eccentricity in the LIGO window, probably at 10 hertz. So here is the comparison between the analytical formula in dashed lines and the numerical uh, calculations in solid lines. You'll see that the agreement is uh, better for, for large A2 because in this case you'll have large number of cosine of oscillations. And you can imagine this procedure actually like integrating out cosine of cycles. So the, the more cycles you have, the more, more precision you will have in predicting the final eccentricity. Now that given all initial parameters, we can predict the final eccentricity. The uh, next question is uh, how should we apply this formula to different initial parameters? Uh, here, let me illustrate the idea using the galactic center as an example. Uh, in galactic center, we have not only a central black hole, but also a very large number of small objects, stellar objects around, and they can do a number of things. They can shape the initial distribution of the binary black hole. They can also make the binary black hole evaporate, and you need to take account of all <coughs> these things. Uh, a particular point I'd like to mention is that People already know for a very long time that in galactic center, uh, the, the, the mass distribution actually forms a custody distribution with a certain power law. But uh, to my best knowledge, this has never been observed uh, in any galactic center. So the question is how to resolve that very small regions in the center. On top of, on top of that, people also say, there will be mass segregation of uh, massive black holes if they, are, if they are heavier than the nearby object. So all these things are theoretical predictions without any observational evidence. So it will be nice if we can observe the binary black holes from these channels because using our analytical mapping and giving all those initial conditions you can actually see the distribution of ex final eccentricity of such stellar mass black holes in galactic center. Assuming different prediction of uh, uh, different distributions of the mass in galactic center, you will have different distribution of eccentricity. <laughs> and more interestingly, uh, they, we found a correlation between mass and eccentricity. So larger mass, black holes with larger mass tend to have smaller eccentricity. Of course, at this point, you can you, you might say I'm cheating because LIGO can eventually uh, 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 can eventually probe eccentricity as small as 0.01, 0.01 uh, 
So here it is plotted in log scale. From O1 is somewhere here. So you can only measure to the right of this. Uh, it is just a tail of the distribution. You cannot do better than that. But we also have a space telescope like LISA. In that case, you can observe the binary with lower frequency. And in that case, the orbital separation is larger. So you can move your lowest value of the country somewhere here. So probably you can resolve the peak of this distribution using LISA. We already had some constraints, right, from the date of light. Which does it prefer? Oh, uh, I don't think. Yeah, right. So I don't think Lisa has. Uh, sorry, right. LIGO has already take eccentricity into their template uh, because it's actually changing to produce the eccentric templates. And now they can only put some uh, uh, bound on the eccentricity. For example, in the very first detection, they uh, they say it is consistent with eccentricity smaller than point one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know that eccentricity reduces very fast if you go to high frequency, so you may want to push LIGO to 10 hertz to make such things. This, is, this will happen in the next few years, probably. <coughs> so LISA can do better. And not only that. Uh, this is because LISA can precisely measure the binary black holes that we already see, we have already seen in LIGO, and uh, Lisa people says maybe eventually we can see uh, thousands of such uh, objects. So what Lisa can do is not just to see the early spiral stage with large eccentricity, but uh, something more interesting. One thing that Lisa is very different from LIGO. Is that, is that LIGO see events only in very short time duration, like one minute or several seconds. But LISA can monitor, can monitor these uh, objects in years, like five years. So if, if you can really monitor these binaries in several years, you can imagine to uh, measure not only the gravitational wave, the eccentricity, but also the Doppler shift of the very central motion of the binary. So actually, I will also have a paper about measuring the very central motion even in LIGO. This is possible, but quite challenging. You need some lab to produce a, a triple system with very small distance. But with this, this channel I just talked about in uh, galactic center, this kind of motion will be actually quite common in LISA. Why? This is a simple scaling exercise. We know that the Earth orbits around the Sun uh, one year in a period. And we scale up the mass of the Sun to a supermassive black hole, six orders of magnitude. And we scale up the distance to 100 AU. And you see this is exactly one year. What does this mean? It means that if you, if you monitor such binaries in LISA for five years, Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be able to resolve uh, five cycles. And this slide just show you uh, what will have the, the precision of such measurement. I will not go into detail, just to show you it's actually possible to measure the, the, these orbital parameters well. And the final slide to show you a more interesting aspects of this LISA measurement. That is, if you zoom in this plot to the uh, upper right corner, you will actually see some cosine lead of oscillation in motion. So this will be the first manifestation of cosine oscillation in gravitational way, since it is uh, first in proposed. OK, that's all I want to talk. And there are, of course, many more things to do. I will not read this in detail. but. I, I, would, I would cry for the templates. So all this measurement needs well-built templates for gravitational wave, and this should be very important for us as a next step. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, question. Maybe on that last point, 
people are now making templates with eccentricity and tilted spin and all that. Are you saying that you now want templates that include a third body? Yes. <laughs> okay. That I will be more That's what you want. Okay. So the Paris sign of motion. Of <laughs> That's going to take yeah. a while. Yeah. This one can do analytic. Analytic you've already done. So, yeah. 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 And so this case actually is simpler than orbital motion. Because what you want to measure is eccentricity change. Yeah. You just need to parameterize eccentricity as a simple function, maybe two, two more parameters. That would be enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's interesting going to dinner. Just let me know. Actually, you might remember the first one. Um, batteries. Yeah.